specifically also track and field. So looking forward to your lecture, Marcus. That was a very short introduction, so apologies for Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for inviting, uh, and uh, I'm glad I made it <laughs> just on time. Uh, it's always great to be here and present in front of, uh, of uh, a lot of interested and interesting people about a variety of things I do. Uh, probably there's a number of you very confused by now because I spoke four or five times here about everything from handball to vitamin D to <laughs> technology in sport. Um, I'm not an academic by profession. I work in sport, and, and what I do is trying to solve problems, understand issues, find solutions. So it's... Uh, uh, some of the things I come across uh, are very diverse, um, and so that's that's why uh, you hear me talking about different things. So um, this one today is very important for two things. It's the first lecture of the year, and it's the year of the World Championships in Athletics here, so we have to start with something to do with athletics. And the other one is um, is one of the issues we have in, uh, in sport, uh, all sports, but in athletics in particular, it's understanding how athletes evolve. There's lots of academies uh, around the world. There's lots of youth programs being developed. One of the key things is always to try to understand the talent you have, where he's heading, and if you're making the right investment. Also, uh, around the world, things are changing in sport. Sport is now a business, and all the funding agencies in sport worldwide are moving towards business models. And, and one of the first things they ask you if you are a, a coach or a performance director is, okay, we're going to invest all this money in you, what's the chance of return for the investment in terms of medals? So the days where you say, oh, this guy is really good because I say so, are gone because you have to present evidence that your cohort of athletes is actually heading in a direction that might win a medal for them. Of course, there is no guarantee of medals. There is no magic trick to predict if an athlete is going to win a medal or not. But nowadays, we can understand where things are heading and we can have more information about the likelihood of not winning a medal uh, and the chances of getting into the medal potential. So uh, I'll start with the conflict of interest disclosure. Uh, I'm not, I don't have any uh, conflict of interest uh, to disclose in this presentation. I'll not be discussing any off-label or unapproved use of drugs or products uh, in this presentation. So don't end up with that. So the outline of today is, uh, uh, we, we will start defining talent in uh, what we can define CGS sports, which means centimeters, grams, and seconds sports. Uh, the good thing about these sports is that there is no ifs and buts. You complete the race, you complete a competition, uh, you complete a throw, and there is a measure. Uh, and and there is no, it's not like refereeing, it's not like having a penalty, it's not your teammates fall, it's pretty straightforward. You go from A to B faster than the others, you win or you throw further than the others, or, or you lift more than others, that's how you win. So in a way, it's relatively easy to understand where things are going. Uh, I will try to illustrate how you can use competition data to track athletes' development, and some of the work we've done, and some of the work we are doing in Aspire. Um, I will present some typical developments on track and field athletes, and uh, most of all the differences between elite and non-elite. Um, if you have kids that participate in sport or if you've been involved in youth sport, how many times do you go to a competition, a kid wins and then wins by a margin uh, and then everyone says, oh, he's a super talent. But when you put it into the world context, the super, super, super talents are, are an extremely rare occurrence. So that's the important thing. So when you see something that looks really good, the question you need to ask is always how good it really is and where is it heading? Uh, and also I will uh, talk about other applications of performance tracking uh, and again how it can be used to do to do other things and, and, and probably we can we can also have a bit of fun about that. So if you want to predict where a child is heading and if he's going from the bottle to the medal, uh, one thing you need to make sure you do is that you observe the journey. So this is this is my biggest thing is it's not how they look when you look at them, it's how they look at as they grow. So identifying somebody just on the basis on a performance at a particular age group might be the wrong approach. It's the journey and the story that tells you where they might be heading. And in terms of clinical aspects, it's very important that this journey is made very long. Because if this journey is cut short because of injuries or inability to recover, they're not gonna make it. They're not gonna continue in the journey. 
So very important for clinical applications. So first of all, let's define talent. What is talent? So a talent in a sport is an individual whose athletic performances are superior to his peer group, and, and this person, he or she, is capable of reaching or has achieved consistent performance at top level. So we see that all the time, youth competition, somebody wins, wins two, three times, or dominates in his region, town, province, is a talent by definition, because he beats everyone else, he beats the peers, he's there. But as a national governing body or, or an Olympic association, what you're interested in is not how they look like now, is how they're going to look like in 20 years' time. Because what you need to have is a larger pool of people that are able to win in 20 years' time. So here is the mismatch already. As a club coach, you're interested in winning now because that's how you're judged. As, as an organization, you want to make sure that your athletes go, uh, go on a path. And the other thing is that um, I, I found amazing worldwide is that sometimes people are defined as talents, but when you put them into the world context or the continental context, they are nowhere near. So realism comes from evidence and evidence beats opinion. So that's why we need data. And this is what everybody does. Uh, it goes around and tries to find uh, the kid that is going to be the next uh, Usain Bolt or, or, or the next big thing uh, in athletics. And, and sometimes uh, you get surprised, you find them at a very, very, very early age, and, and I'll tell you a couple. Uh, but sometimes they are in front of you, you don't see them, because they don't look good at the time, and then suddenly, a few years later, boom, they appear. So athletics, in, in, in reality, is a very simple uh, uh, sport. Uh, you have to be able to do three things, uh, one of them ve uh, very, very well. So it's about running, it's about jumping, and it's about throwing. So what do we know about physiological development of athletes? So the first thing is to understand what is realistic in terms of their physiology development. So when you take kids and you look at how they develop, during lifespan, so from uh, 9 to 17 years of age, there is a plethora of studies that have done longitudinal cross-sectional analysis of various fitness qualities. They all show that kids improve in pretty much everything. They improve in endurance, they improve in strength, they improve in speed, they improve in flexibility, and it's the same for boys and girls. Boys and girls do get better uh, just by growing. Uh, and, and of course, there are differences in performance. So in this particular study, they cluster groups by percentile. So in the lowest percentile, middle percentile, and top percentile in their fitness qualities, they all get better. Um, do the guys in the, the people in the high percentile get better than the lower percentile? Sometimes in some quality, yes, sometimes in some qualities, not. So uh, I'm sorry to bust the bubble, but if you are a coach in a young group, they will improve year on year. You don't know if it's because of you or despite of you, uh, and it's because they grow. They grow, they get better by proxy, even if they, they do close to nothing. They just move, they will get better. So that's the reality of young athletes. And let's look at the particular skills. So if we look at endurance and aerobic capacity, we know that with age, both boys and girls increase peak VO2. When you actually normalize by body mass, things are not that good. But when you look at absolute values, they do get better. And they improve aerobic capacity. Also, sprinting speed improves at any distance. Uh, in boys, this is a review on a very large uh, data set, uh, up to a certain point. So if you just take the general population and you measure their speed ability, they get better up to a point in which they don't get better anymore. Uh, and then we will look into that. And it's exactly the same with, uh, with females. They do get better, they sprint faster at any distance, up to a point, and then improvements in large cohorts are, are, are very, very limited. And we have a database. Um, we used to do uh, genetic fitness testing for all our cohorts over, over a number of years. Uh, and we've seen what everyone else has seen. So the boys do get faster uh, pretty much by 0.29 seconds per year, up until to a point in which they don't get faster. And that's the whole cohort of athletes, from squash players to table tennis to athletes. But when you're working with athletics, of course, you want to know what the sprinters do. Uh, because that's your special cohort. They are the fastest guys, and, and you would hope that they get better. So we will look into it. Jumping abilities, uh, again, there's a variety of studies. This is something on football players, uh, but there is plenty in every sport, in every cohort, in every group. So um, by age, you increase your vertical jumping ability. 
So you jump higher just by the, the fact that you're growing, you're increasing muscle mass and, and you jump higher. So the ability to jump improves with age. And it's exactly the same in our cohort. Uh, pretty much the slope is 2.74 centimeters a year. You can see the percentiles ranges. So anybody that is within that range we know is developing normally. Uh, people that are going outside the range, they are developing faster than others or better than others. Anybody below that range is not really uh, developing. So what I'm introducing you is to this concept of performance funnels or ways of tracking progress. So you need to have a large population, you know what normality looks like, and then you can plot your individual athlete into this plot and say, okay, is this person, first of all, better than others at any age group? And most of all, is their development pathway better than the others? Because that's the key. The athletes that reach the peak should be the ones that learn faster or get better than others, not the ones that look good at a particular age point. And I'll prove it with numbers. And then in throws, and in general in strength, we know that uh, both boys and girls do get better with age. So when we're working with young athletes it, and, and we try to assess their performance, it is really complicated because they are growing and they are getting better by growing, but also they are training and they are competing, and they get better by doing that. So it's virtually impossible to separate the two. And there's lots of studies that look at different cohorts, uh, like you have a control group uh, that is somebody not really doing sport, and you measure their growth maturation, and you can look at the differential in growth in the other group. But the reality is, is actually relevant. So the relevance is looking at your cohorts, how they develop, and have a reference database that is relevant to that cohort. So if you want to know how well your sprinters are doing, you need to compare them to what sprinters are doing worldwide, because that tells you where they're heading. So um, we started looking at this um, when I was with the Scientific Commission of the Italian Track and Field Federation. Uh, but these data are very relevant to, to, to any population, really. We, we had the chance to look at the Italian database. So if you're interested in the paper, this is the paper. Uh, to look at. Um, so there's a few thousand records uh, in the Italian database from 1994 to 2014. Uh, the first eight or nine years was in paper, so it took a bit of time for the PhD. I'm glad I'm not a PhD or a postdoc anymore, so they had to go through that. But So the concept is this. You build a, a funnel of performance. You know that performance increases with age up to a point, and then it levels off. But what we are really interested in is, is find out the ones that make it to the top, how do they look like? Do they look different to the ones that don't make it? What's their difference? Do they progress at a higher rate or not? Uh, the other thing is also to develop um, a normative database. So if I um, want to track a particular athlete and I have this information, I can put their performance at any age and that tells me where they're heading. <laughs> And I have a much better idea of what their potential and their realistic progression can be. Uh, and it's all about realistic expectations. So again, we are not trying to say this person is going to win a medal. What we're trying to say is that this progression is likely to get him into contention for a medal. And if we have data from world performance, continental performance, so in this case, we need comparison with Asia, uh, and then regional performance, Arabs, than local performance, Qatar. So we can say, OK, this guy has got a chance to win a medal at Qatar level, enter into competition at Arab level, be non-competitive Asian level, no chance at world level, or the other way around. This guy can win everything all the way up, or could be in that mix. So uh, in this particular paper, we color coded it. So in blue, you have people that, of course, are very low performance in, uh, in high jump and long jump in men. Uh, in in uh, shaded up to yellow is people that, again, nowhere from medals. And then at the top, it's uh, the people that were in the 4% uh, of the percentile. Why did we use the 4%? It's because we tried everything from 1% to 5%, and the statistics are exactly the same. So 4% gives us a, a slightly bigger sample size to work with. Uh, and you can see that there is a lot of people that are in the middle, and then there's very few that, that reach the top. So that tells us that really there is a difference between them. The other thing we were interested in knowing was, are the ones that really make it to the top 
at the top when they are young? And, and when do they appear uh, to be at the top? Because one of the questions we were trying to, to answer was, is there a need for early specialization in athletics, and in this particular paper, in the jumps? So we analyzed the age of beginning, so when do athletes enter competition? And we tried to see if there was a difference between the top performers when they are adults and the rest. And, and surprise, surprise, there is, and this has now been confirmed by another couple of papers in other cohorts, in Norwegian athletes and English athletes. So in these disciplines, you might not need to enter competition at a very early age. You might actually enter later and still reach the top. So there is no evidence that you need early specialization in, in, in these two events. And it's the same for men and women. Uh, the other interesting thing that again is now confirmed by others is that you reach uh, maximal performance um, later in life. Uh, and it's probably a, a, a Darwinian theory. It's selection of the fittest. If you keep progressing, you stay in the sport and, and, and then you perform. Or it's because you didn't break down, you're still alive, you manage to, to make it. Uh, to the top, or funding camps, or, or a for a variety of reasons, which we cannot identify purely from results. Fact is, if we can prolong the career of talented people, they will get to the top. And that's a key thing uh, for clinical staff or anybody involved in, uh, in developing athletes. And that's the same for men and women uh, in these two particular events. But that's the interesting thing. So. Um, What's the percentage of top-level adult athletes we, which were top-level performers as young athletes? So at 12 years of age, only 2% of the women high jump top senior athletes were top at 12. At 13, there is a very small number of people. And it gets a little bit better when they get to 17 years of age. But still, even at 17 years of age, only 40% of the men high jump cohort then became top. A senior. So what looks good up until 18 might not tell you the full story. So there's a lot of athletes that up until 18 might still be top athletes, but they don't look good at the time, and there is a risk of losing them. And then for each age, uh, that's the percentage of top-level young athletes that performed at top level when they became adults. So 80% uh, performed at top level when they became adults. Um, in this, in this particular court. So my argument is that tracking progression is absolutely important. And this reinforces the message because we then looked at the rate of progression of top level athletes in this cohort of more than a few thousands uh, versus the others. And, and what you see is that the rate of progression of the top cohort is, is better than the others, um, pretty much at every age. Um, and the rate of progression gets smaller and smaller by the age of 18 or 19. So what's the effect of growth? We don't know. What we know is that the people that reach the top, for whatever reasons, they develop faster and better than the others. We have no data on training. We have no data on quality of training. But because they enter competition like the others, we assume they, they have the same possibilities that others do. And it was impossible to pinpoint a particular region or a particular coach. But um, this is now shown in, in other people. But two, two things for you. One is, what's the realistic rate of change? So if a coach tells you or, or, or someone tell, expects a young boy to improve 35% from 13 to 15 years of age in performance, it's unrealistic or it's highly unlikely. So these numbers actually inform what things, what, what, what can happen. And then if something really spectacular happens, it can still happen, but it's spectacular, so it's rare. So that's why it's important to know that. Um, this is work from the uh, Norwegian group, looking at the top um, 200 players, uh, 200 athletes, 200 scores in the, in the Norwegian cohort from Tonnesen. So this is from 11 to 18 years of age. The events where the boys improve the most is the jumps. So they can improve in long jump up to 48% from the uh, performance they have at 11. More or less 40% uh, in high jump. Uh, in 800 meters, about 20%. And in sprints, about 15% from 11 to 18. 
uh, and this is uh, what happens on, on this side. This is what happens with the girls. Uh, less improvement in, in percentage terms. So that's what's realistic. From 11 to 18 years of age, there is now consistent evidence that you can improve anything between 30 to 55%. Anything outside that is a spectacular achievement. Uh, anything below that, then you should question what you're doing uh, coaching-wise or probably the quality of the athlete is not that good. But what it also means, if you look at the rate of change, is that clever coaching really needs to start around the age 16 to 18 because that's when uh, the margins for improvement are, are, are starting to become tiny and tiny and tiny. So that's where clever, clever things really need to happen. So if you want the crystal ball, uh, what do you do with it? Uh, because one thing is to track progression of, of the athlete. One thing is to know where they are. So our argument was that if you actually use um, only their performance, the relationship between their performance at a very young age and the performance at senior age has limited relationship even up to the age of 18. But if you add the rate of change in performance, your chance of predicting where they end up is actually higher. But still, there is a large variability to be accounted for. So when you're tracking athletes' progression, it's important to have their performance and their rate of development because both things tell you where they might end up. Um, and of course, what would add more would be knowing about their maturation status. Because if they are already matured at a very early stage, it's likely that the rate of change in performance will level off earlier. So it's unlikely that they will progress further. But that's what needs to be done research-wise. Uh, then we looked at other events. Um, and other people have done the same. So uh, in this particular paper, we looked at answering this question. So wh when do they reach performance? Do they need to enter uh, at a very early age in these events? Where are they? Where they end up? And very similar thing here. So the top level ad adult athletes that were considered top levels when they were younger to 18 years of age, the percentage is very, very small. It's a bit higher with girls. So with girls, you can tell a bit earlier I I if they are getting there. But with boys, um, only 22% uh, of the males in this cohort was actually uh, top when they were when they were adults. So you know you're taking you're taking a gamble when you look at a, a very young boy predicting where they're going um, so at best you're talking about 31 to 42 percent uh, in this particular events to be able to predict where they're going and when do they uh, perform the best is there a difference between the top athletes and the others there seems to be so again like in the other events they get the peak performance later, but it can be because they survive, they develop, they enjoy the sport. There is no biological reason. But actually, the interesting thing about this paper was that there was a relationship between the age of entering and the age of reaching top performance. So what, what the data actually suggests is that it's better to enter later, so you have more chances to perform later. Uh, and the other interesting one is that uh, 15 out of 40 males and 12 out of 41 females in the sprints group didn't start competing until after 18 years of age. So in athletics, you still have a chance, even at a very late, late stage, if you have those physical traits to enter, uh, probably not in the highly technical events like pole vault or, or discus throw, uh, but in, in sports where there is a strong physical component, you're really good, you can still come out of the blue age 18, 19 and beat everyone else and develop very quickly in a couple of years if you stay injury free. Um, what about throws? There aren't many data about throwers. Um, so somebody wants to do the research. Uh, there's a lot to be done there. But what we know, this is work from uh, Francesca Piacentini in Italy. So this is the number of finalists at uh, World Junior and Youth Championships from 2002 and 2010, and they checked how many of these were actually disappearing from the world ranking lists in 2012. So look at how many disappear from each event. So the conversion rate of success of entering competition at, at junior level in throws uh, and then becoming a top level thrower, it's very slim. In fact, out of this cohort, only eight athletes won a medal from 2005 to 2012 in all this large cohort that was observed. So again, predicting performance from junior performance um, 
doesn't seem to be uh, really good uh, with throwing events. Uh, and what they did also was quite interesting. They normalized uh, the performance according to the implement. Uh, if you're not familiar with athletics, as age progresses, you are throwing a heavier implement. So in order to compare what, what performance is doing, one way is to, to do a ratio of mass of the implement per kilo of body mass and trying to see if they get better. And of course, when you change the implement, actually the, sh the male shot put uh, athletes get worse when they, when they move to, to senior uh, because the implement is bigger, they throw it closer and then they throw the other one. But when the implement is the same weight, performance of course gets better. So again, understanding context gives you metrics to, to really see where, where things are going. Gender differences. Um, is female athletes progression reduced uh, after age 18? Uh, there's some good news. Yes, it is a little bit reduced, but it seems to be uh, uh, the, the career can be a bit longer uh, in female athletes. If you look at the differential in uh, performance between boys and girls in various events, there is this magic window uh, around age 12, 13 of age where uh, boys become different from girls. Uh, uh, it is quite obvious to everybody involved in the, in the medical field, but um, what's interesting is to see what's the realistic progression in percentage terms. Um, so this is again the work from the top 100 Norwegian male and female performers in each discipline. Look at the rate of improvement year on year. By the age of 16 to 18, the top 100 Norwegian performers all improved 0.8% uh, in this event. In the 800s is 1.2, 0.4%. In the long jump, 0.2%. And in the high jump, 0.1%. So two things here. First, you need clever coaching. And then if you, if you are a scientist that works in a lab, and, and you're really worried about p-values and magnitudes and all the kind of stuff, there is no way you can measure that performance. You know, a difference between a second and a centimeter is a huge difference. And the rate of progression in this is way smaller than any coefficient of variation of every measure we do or, or, or any magnitude of uh, intervention we do. So when you read studies about elite athletes, that improve 20% uh, about something uh, performance related, then, then you should really question it because this is the reality of when they do the, their top performance. Uh, of course, the, the reason for that is this. So these are all the world records. Um, it's a massive database, great paper from Andelsmann. Uh, these are all the world records by age group. There is a website that you can go on and see how fast the seven years old run. Don't go because it's depressing. Um, but if you're interested in it, uh, these guys have, done a, have normalized the gender difference in percentage. And you can see there is a sigmoidal curve. So difference accelerates around 12 to 13 years of age. It's the same in jumping and it's the same in swimming. What's the reason for that? Testosterone. Uh, and that's why it's the most abused uh, drug in, in athletics because it does make, make a difference. But that explains the, the growth difference and the differential between boys and girls. Uh, however, they both develop and they can both improve performance in different events and we will see how. And of course, uh, the difference in testosterone and the difference in performance happens quite spectacularly when you measure strength. So this is um, about 19 studies, uh, more than 5,000 males, 5,000 females in uh, uh, hand strength, um, grip, grip strength, which is a generic measure of strength and magically things change uh, when testosterone increases around 12 to 13 years of age. So anything before 12 years of age, it's not going to tell you anything. Uh, anything in this growth phase might not tell you anything because they're still growing and developing. Then you need to look at what happens after. So why it's important to have data? So what we've seen is what's realistic rate of progression where athletes are when they are young, what's the likelihood of turning into elite performance. Uh, so having a systematic approach with data helps coaching, helps funding, helps strategy in, in uh, national governing bodies. And this is what people around the world do. Uh, uh, this is what we were doing uh, in the UK. Uh, this is what other people do. Pretty much what everyone is looking at is 
what are the chances in the next two or three Olympic cycles of medals coming, where are they going, and they're using this big data, because data are now available, they are not in paper form, they tend to be in databases, and, and, and I'll show you some surprising databases uh, that you can find information on. So, uh, data are important for other things too, uh, you can also find out if somebody's cheating, and by cheating it's not only about drugs, it's about performance too, so, so I'll give you a few examples of that. So, a uh, good paper from uh, Olaf and, and Sergei Ilyukov here. So, having data tells you how trends are going. So, uh, this is the discus throw in females' uh, performance. Uh, look at what happens when anabolic steroids enter the sport. Big improvement in performance. And then, as soon as the uh, anti-doping test starts, big drop in performance. So, world trends. Anti-doping does work because it does reduce the chances of... Uh, of uh, artificially enhancing performance, and it's the same with EPO in the 10,000 meters men. Suddenly, uh, EPO is commercially introduced and, and people start to run a lot faster. Uh, that We know that, but actually, again, having a longitudinal approach to uh, analyzing performance of athletes, seeing what their typical performance is high, uh, and seeing what the world trends are, can help you spotting few unusual things. So, again, from that paper, these are the 24 uh, hammer throwers that were into the Rio Olympic Games. Uh, if you look at the arrow here, these are all the performances of these individual athletes, athlete 21, athlete 24, in the three years leading up to the Games and at the Games. And guess what? Uh, there is a very abnormal, sudden, special performance happening here that is outside variability. It's more than 10 meters different from what they normally do. Uh, so what do you do there? is, uh, of course, you go back and you look at their biological passport and, and you might find a few surprises. Um, then athlete, I think it was athlete 21 or 22, was a, a previous doping offender. So sometimes the effect of doping manifests itself later on, and I'll show you another case. But to me, that's the other interesting one. So again, if you're not familiar with athletics, in order to go and participate to a major event like the Olympic Games, the World Championships, you have to qualify. And at the moment, the rules are still the same. In order to qualify, you have to produce a distance or uh, a time according to, to your event. So in the case of hammer throwing, to qualify for Rio, you needed to do 77 meters. And uh, from experience, I can tell you that around the world, sometimes you see some very, very strange results happening in different parts of the world. And you wonder if people really, really qualified. Uh, and that happens in every sport that is measured with distances and centimeters, grams, and, and and um, seconds. But this is a very interesting case. So you have athlete 6 and athlete 16 that are from the same country. You look at their performances and they make 77 only once. And it happens in the same town, in the same competition. So what are the chances? So uh, having, having performance data really, really helps you with, uh, with a lot of things, not only, not only uh, understanding progression, but also understanding unusual, strange performances uh, that, that you can be aware of. But to me, that's the other one. That's the scary bit. So, there are now publicly available databases uh, that you can, you know, there's many of us here that compete in weekend warriors uh, competitions. Uh, I could find results of a lot of us uh, in this room. Um, but why is, is this interesting, again, for cheating? So, first of all, you know what performances are in different parts of the world. You can model where things are going worldwide. And if you are investing in a particular sport, so for example, if you're interested in triathlon, which is the fastest growing sport at the moment worldwide, uh, or marathon, which is another big public sport, and you want to know what's happening around the world, it's very easy to do it. So if you have athletes, you, you know what they need to do in order to win, what's the likelihood of them winning by just looking what's happening worldwide. And also you know how realistic can be that. But that's a scary thing. So uh, here is the story. So Mr. Mike Rossi uh, takes the children out of school and he says to the school, because I'm running the Boston Marathon. Now, to run the Boston Marathon, you have to qualify. You have to do a certain time. So takes the kids out, puts it on the internet, and everyone says, yeah, right, you know, you qualified, you need to take the kids there, it's a good idea. And then people start digging. It's bad news when people start digging on you. 
So what happened was people went to this website, at links, where you can also find your deputy director of sports science on, or other people in this room. I don't know if Dan is here, but Dan, you're getting better with age. Uh, you're improving, so that's good news. But you can find pretty much anybody that has entered any, any marathon or triathlon or anything like that. So what happened was this crowd of people on social media started digging, and what they found out is that the pace this guy was running at in the last six years of entering marathons was nowhere near the pace he ran when he qualified for Boston. So they started questioning it, and then other people got involved, and they dug out all the pictures of the race, and they found that he only had a picture at the start, so his bib crossed the start line, and at the end, so his bib crossed the end line, but he was nowhere near the other 10 people that finished in front of him or behind him in any picture over the course of the marathon race. And there is now a large number of people that have been found cheating. And this is actually happening in qualifying at youth and junior events around the world in different parts. It can happen. And so having data helps you really understand these poorest performances and, wh and what they're heading. But having data also helps you uh, understanding what you need to do to win. So this is an example. This is data from uh, what John Peters has done. He's a data mining expert. He's quite nicely shared this with me. Um, so he's created an engine that interrogates the IWF database uh, around the world. And what you can do, you can model performance by uh, ranking, by groups, by age, by discipline, etc. So for example, if you're interested in sprinting, that's the mean uh, sprinting times of the top 25 in the world uh, from uh, 2010 to 2018. Uh, Tryon Brummel ran 997, which was also age group uh, world record holder for a couple of age groups. Pretty spectacular performance. But what this tells me is that, you know, what's the chance of one of my athletes getting in the mix to win a medal at the world uh, under 20 champs? Well, if my athlete is running uh, slower than 10 to 20, they are slim or close to none. So understanding world trends tells you what you need to do to win a medal. Not the exact time, but the range, and how realistic your chances can be. So, you read a lot about it around the world, and, and, and it's happening everywhere. You know, athletes get deselected, they make the standard to qualify to a championship, and then the national governing body doesn't take them there. It doesn't happen because they don't like them, it happens because bringing an athlete to a major event is expensive. And we are all into sport for participation purposes, but some nations are driven by the need to win. And if you know somebody has got no chance of winning, why would you take them there? And it's probably the wrong approach for certain aspects, but from a financial aspect, that's why people think that way. So having access to this really helps you. Uh, this is other, uh, another example. So this is the power of 10 database in the UK. So every time somebody runs, this is the standard for the uh, European Championships. This is the target top 10. Everybody that makes those numbers, they get into this. And so that's the selection criteria that get applied to go to major events. Um, but does it mean that everybody that makes it as a junior uh, transforms into senior? Maybe not. What helps is the, the, the development of what are called performance funnels. So what I showed you before. What you do is you track the individual, you track their progression, and you see which way they are heading. So if you do it with young athletes, you can really see if they are improving, if they are progressing. Even if their performance relative to their age is not fantastic at that time, what you can really track is which way they're heading and which way they're going. So this is what we're building with the database we have. We have all the boys that are in Aspire uh, recorded in every competition they do. And we have now the world database. We have those databases that I showed you. And we are trying to rebuild the Asian database so we want to compare their funnel, their development, according to what's happening worldwide, and also what are the world trends. So that gives us a better perspective of where these boys are heading and where they're going. So junior to senior, the power of 10 has shown exactly what other studies I showed you before have done. So the percentage of top 20 ranked senior males and senior females at the end of 2014-15 track and field session, which were top 20 in each age grade is very small. So if you try to predict anything from before the age of 16, 18, it's highly unlikely you can predict it uh, on a group level. Uh, I'm, I'm not going into that, it's exactly the same thing. 
but again, understanding realistic progressions. So this is another study um, indicating here on this side, that's the peak performance age between the top 10 and the top uh, 100 in the world. So in this study, I think they analyzed uh, 14,000 athletes. So it's quite a, quite a good database. So there is a little bit of a difference between uh, the age of reaching performance in the top 10 and the top 100 worldwide. Slight difference between women. So women tend to reach it later uh, in most events. But in throws events, the, the men reach it later than women. Um, and, and that's where the difference lies. But look at the percentage improvements. So the athletes that improve the most five years before they produce their best are the throwers. So the throwers can still improve before they reach their best quite a lot, uh, whether the improvement of the sprinters is 2% in the five years preceding reaching their best. Uh, and there is, of course, a difference between men and women and uh, top 10 and uh, 100 to 1100. But this is the annual improvement in performance in 14,500 athletes that are at the top of the world. Look at the difference. So from the age of 20 up until they pretty much retire, you're talking about in 100 meters a 0.2%, less than 0.2% average improvement year on year until they get old uh, and they get worse. So the, the margins are tiny, 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 tiny. And this is why when you see something really spectacular, the statistician in me goes, oh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, it, it looks a bit suspicious, uh, but we shouldn't be like that because things do happen. Uh, but they are highly unlikely. So this is how we, how we explain that. And if you look at the differences in events, you know, the crossing point is later for throwers. So throwers get better with age, uh, a bit like uh, um, uh, th th that's peculiar of throwing. But in other events, uh, they start reducing performance uh, a bit earlier. So again, understanding realistic, realistic expectations, uh, pretty similar in women tiny margins, and they start dropping, uh, they actually get worse. But there is the exception all the time. So I hope you don't walk away from here thinking that oh, there's no point in looking at youngsters because it doesn't tell you anything, and even if they are good, they will never be good. No, Th there is youngsters that are very, very good at a very, very early stage, uh, and they become very, very good later on. So a few cases here, um, Meyer, is the current world record holder for uh, decathlon. In September, he did the world record. Uh, he was 1999 world youth champion, uh, 2000 world junior champion, 2017 world champion. So yes, he was pretty good uh, from, a, from a pretty early age, and he's still progressing, so he might do another world record. Uh, Usain Bolt, uh, if you were not in athletics and you thought he, you th you thought he was a meteor in, uh, in Beijing, he, the kid was pretty good. Um, in 2002, he won the World Junior Championships as a youth, uh, and he was holding uh, the world records at age group, at various age groups since a very, very early age. I think 14 years of age, he was world record holder already. Uh, world youth, became world youth champion after becoming world junior champion, so in, the, in his age group, and then world champion and world record holder. But that's the interesting thing. So if you look at this um, performance funnel, that's a very interesting thesis if you want to read it. Um, this is Usain Bolt, at every age group, he was faster than everyone else. But see how others develop. So people develop, Frankie Fredericks could sustain performance and do his best uh, later on in life. So again, understanding progression is really telling you where athletes are going uh, and you need the patience. And the reason why you need the patience is that they can surprise you. So Jessica Ennis was fifth in the World Youth Championships, was eighth in the World Junior Championship. Was she good? Yeah, pretty good. Um, look at that performance development. So Jessica's results in the heptathlon are in blue. Look at the development by age. She keeps getting better and better and better. She can sustain performance even after childbirth. And she wins, she wins medal there. So her performance pathway, completely different from Carolina Kluft, which was way better at any young age, and sadly stopped performing in heptathlon due to an injury. And if you look at number one, two, and three of the World Championships in uh, uh, London, TM, Schaffer, and Vetter, look at their performance pathways. At the moment, it looks like there is no continuous progression. We will see what happens in the World Championships here. But the rate of progression of Jess was way better than everyone else, and that's what 
allowed her to have a prolonged career. And of course, there is the oddities. So this orange data are from Blonska. Uh, Blonska was um, a silver medalist in Beijing, but she lost the medal the morning after um, for a doping offense uh, in Beijing. And then uh, a few years later, the number three lost the medal, and Kelly Soderton won finally the bronze medal. But look at performances here. So she gets worst. She gets found out for doping offense for steroids here. Two years later, comes back. Performance gets better, and then she gets disqualified. So a few examples of delayed effect of, of doping offenses. They get better after they get disqualified. And if you're interested in aging, uh, this is a study, again, analyzing results in, uh, in the north of Germany. Uh, what happens is that from age 10 to 20, you do get a lot better. Um, you have some chances of getting better from 20 to 30. Uh, and uh, in, in throws, you can still get a little bit better around uh, 32, 33, 34. But sadly, it's all downhill from there. Um, so it, it, it rapidly goes down performance-wise. And this is the same in, in pretty much every other event. So building all this information helps you really understand where the athletes are, where they're heading, and have realistic expectations with the athletes and the coaching staff, but also predicting where they end up. So in summary, um, performance in track and field events before the age of 16 is, a, is, is really not a good predictor of uh, adult performance. What that tells you is if, if you know the maturation of the athlete, you can see if, if the athlete is already mature, actually there is a high chance that this athlete looks good because he's already mature. If you don't have maturation data, then even more you need, the, you need to track progression. The rate of progression from 13 to 18 years of age could be a better way to assess performance potential. And I think if you can track the athlete longitudinally from the time they enter competition all the way, that tells you better where they are likely to end up and where things are going. Um, there are clear differences between events, gender, female athletes showing earlier potential than males. You know, the data are there, but there is a lot of data still that need to be analyzed. But I think this is the reality. I don't think there is a, there's a large variety there. Uh, main thing is that most of the top level adult athletes were not top level at youth level. So success at youth level doesn't guarantee you uh, to become top. Um, and most, sadly, most of the top level youth athletes do not become top level adult athletes. So there's quite a lot of athletes that look really, really good when they're youth and junior, and then they completely disappear from the rankings in athletics for various reasons. So having a systematic approach using large results databases is important to understand the likelihood of success on the international stage, track the development of athletes, assess their potential, assess their development, because what you're really interested in is, is the athlete developing, yes or no? But then to really understand their potential, you need to know what's happening worldwide. So then there is now uh, sports intelligence officers employed in different parts of the world by different Olympic committees. Their job is actually this, to look at performance trends worldwide and say, okay, we need to do, in order to win a medal in this sport, we need to run this or throw this or do that. Do we have the capacity in our cohort? Or, for example, is there a gap in a particular event? So is performance in pole vault women really evolving? If not, that could be a potential gap. That's where the investment could go. So this is how clever people are thinking now. Uh, and there is, of course, other uses for results databases, like looking at spurious performances, not only from a, a, a drugs cheating standpoint, but also from a performance cheating standpoint. And actually what will make it very interesting is if the IWF approves this new concept uh, of point system for qualifying, because that might solve this problem, but makes it even more important, the, the, the ability to, tra to track data of the athletes, understand where performances are, and be clever of where you put your athletes to compete and which competition, so it makes it even more. So talent progression should be assessed combining athletic results with other aspects of growth and maturation. If you have a cohort of athletes that you want to look at, you always need to put it into the context of maturation, uh, especially if you look at young athletes. And the assessment of performance progression might be also used to flag unusual suspect performances and help with anti-doping efforts. I think it's very, very, very important. If you see something really strange, you should go and take a closer look at it. 
thank you for uh, your patience and your attention. <laughs>